Videodrome is death. Living in the age of overstimulation, we're constantly bombarded by incoming stimuli that rip apart and fragment our psyches. Marshall McLuhan, the media theorist, considered the electronic epoch to represent the age of anxiety. In his seminal work, Understanding Media, the Extension of Man, he theorizes that the technology is the extension of our body. So, for example, the wheel is the extension of our feet. Clothing is the extension of our skin whereas the house is the extension of our immune system, the steam engine and the mechanical technology of our musculature, and naturally the electronic technology is the extension of our central nervous system. As he argues, when an organ is extended into a specific medium, brains numb it and hence amputate it. Autoamputation is the brain's mechanism to relieve itself from the continuous pain and overstimulation which it is unable to locate in space. In the world of the internet, which McLuhan predicted with his concept of the global village, one wears the whole of humanity as his skin. In the same way, a farmer no longer fills the soil with his feet as he sits on a little cubicle on top of the tractor, a modern man who has extended his central nervous system into electronic technology has numbed faculties of self-control and decision-making. Hence, in the introduction, McLuhan states, if the 19th century was the age of the editorial chair, ours is the century of the psychiatric's couch. The person of the pre-electronic age was a typographic man with a linear, hyper-concentrated approach to life. The editorial chair removes his back and extracts the relevant part of his individuality, as in the pre-electronic age one expresses himself with a private point of view. The psychoanalytic couch, on the other hand, is integral and tries to join and assemble the fragmented parts of our psyche. Integrality, then, is the result of an electronic age, which ended the world of specialism and isolation of an individual and shifted him into the collective engagement of the global village. Now, the Western man who was engineered to act without reacting, like a cold-hardened surgeon who cuts the circumscribed area of the body without much emotion, is now gone as electronic media compresses the whole world into a hot and brimming tribal village, where refusing to participate in the world matters becomes impossible. Living in Cronenberg's scary reality of the Videodrome, where our neurons are merged with the incoming electrons of our devices, one becomes unable to utilize his newly evolved prefrontal cortex. This part of the brain helps you make the right decisions in the right moments creates a conceptual barrier between you and the environment and is endowed with the ability to rationalize and override the pulsing, anxiety-evoking ancient mammalian limbic system which drives your fight-or-flight response. Before I get to the new age of chronic ADHD that contributes to the crisis of anxiety and chronic stress, we need to look at the bigger picture. Before the cognitive overload and the hyperstimulation of the central nervous system took place, after the advent of the digital revolution, people occupied themselves with more modest but relatively healthier activities. Nicholas Carr in his book, The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains, recounts. Despite being surrounded by tens of thousands of books, I don't remember feeling the anxiety that's symptomatic of what we today call information overload. There was something calming in the reticence of all those books, their willingness to wait years, decades even, for the right reader to come along and pull them from their appointed slots. Take your time, the books whispered to me in their dusty voices. We're not going anywhere. The pre-electronic world was a realm of circumscribed life path. One is relatively aware of his social role and duties. Although newspapers flood his brain with deterioratized information from disconnected spaces, he still retains his linear approach to life. Now it turns out that the brain of an internet surfer and that of a book reader is radically different. In the same way Max Wren in the film Videodrome loses his waking consciousness and surrenders to the force of electronic manipulation, a modern human is merged with something that radically alters his brain. To understand the lack of self-awareness with respect to one's continued self-amputation, we need to consult the myth of Narcissus. McLuhan rejects the idea that Narcissus fell in love with himself. Narcissus was not aware that the reflection in the water was his extension. The point of this myth is the fact that men at once became fascinated by any extension of themselves in any material other than themselves. The reflection, then, was his self-amputated image, which was caused by an overstimulating irritation that he received from his admirers. 
the self-amputation as a counter-irritant causes generalized numbness so that one doesn't deal with the overstimulation of senses. As McLuhan puts it, self-amputation forbids self-recognition. Narcissus was relieved from his irritation and stress by creating a numbing effect, as one saw a reflection that he didn't know was his extension. In the electronic world, we become aware that the gadgets we use every day, the shorts and TikTok that we consume, and the toxicity that we swallow from the social media is the extension of our central nervous system. Being offended or hurt on the internet is something that is frowned upon and considered to be a sign of weakness and of being a snowflake. In reality, unlike the world of printing press, where people engage with an abstracted linear sequence of letters that leaves behind a good chunk of emotionality and tonality, the electronic world intermingles all senses into collective synesthesia. Hence, not participating in the global village becomes impossible. One of McLuhan's greatest insights with regards to the electronic world was to make it clear that it was organic. Unlike the mechanical age where humans are abstracted into the focused perspective of Renaissance art and linear sentences of a printed book, a man of global village lives in the acoustic pictorial cavern. The cavern here is the symbol of being surrounded by an army of disconnected bits of information that fight for our attention. When being disconnected or left without a phone, one experiences fear that already has its name, nomophobia, which shows that devices that we carry are actually our extensions. In the same way, Videodrome makes the implicit fact of our merging with technology explicit by synthesizing mechanical and electronic technology with the flesh and blood of a mortal human, we, the consumers of the internet, are merged into social media in virtue of our brain's ability of plasticity. Brain plasticity allows humans to deteriorize themselves from their corporeal bodies. Other than out-of-body experiences and the sensation of merging with the universe as a result of brain plasticity caused by certain psychedelic substances, we also extend ourselves to the everyday objects we interact with. The neuroscientist Vilayan Ramachandran explores the miracle of brain plasticity in his clinical tales, Phantoms in the Brain. With the right tricks, such as placing two people facing each other with closed eyes and having them tap each other's noses while their noses are being tapped by an experimenter in synchrony, creates an illusion that one's nose is elongated to an inadequate degree. In another case, the author tells us about how with the right trick, one's brain can be duped into perceiving a table as an extension of his hand. Ramachandran then goes on to speculate that the sensations of a car, let's say, being the extension of yourself and getting really angry when someone puts a speck of dirt on it, has a neurological basis. The same way thinking that you and your beloved person are one and the same is attributed to brain plasticity. Now, interestingly, one of the most plastic areas of our brains is the somatosensory cortex, responsible for a neural representation of our bodies, which is also known as a homunculus. Homunculus depicts the intensity of tactile sensation, surely the face and hands being the most sensitive to touch. The amputees frequently experience what's known as phantom limbs, as a result of information still being stored in the Penfield map of the somatosensory cortex. Now, interestingly, by virtue of plasticity, one region can be superimposed or invaded by a neighboring region, hence superimposing the sensations of two distinct body parts. For example, when patients were touched on the face, they perceived it on their phantom limbs. In another case, a leg amputee, apart from his genitalia, was experiencing an orgasm throughout his phantom leg, as the penis area invaded the vacant region of the now gone limb. The reason why I'm stressing the tactile aspect of brain plasticity has to do with Marshall McLuhan's understanding of electronic technology. It might seem counterintuitive to you, but he takes the effect of electronic screens to be of tactile nature. He attributed visuality to the era of the printed world. For him, vision is an active modality whereby one follows the perspective and focused lines of Renaissance art and the linear sentences of the page. Whereas being bombarded with the information radiating from the shining screens has to do with massaging your face, hence creating an illusion of depth participation. Now his idea that a person wears whole humanity as his skin makes sense. Consider that extending one's central nervous system is an act of suicidal autoamputation, as donating your consciousness to the web of electronic media and the internet creates a flood of stimulatory effects that one is unable to endure. 
One study showed that internet surfers exhibited hyperactivation of the left prefrontal cortex, whereas naive internet consumers and book readers did not. Other studies have also demonstrated the increased activity of the prefrontal cortex during internet consumption. The problem, though, is that the mesocortical pathway that extends from the dopamine-producing ventral tegmental area to the prefrontal cortex is being worn out and exhausted. Our understanding of how dopamine works is misleading. It derives from the consumerist lens of modern society. Think of dopamine not as something that you receive, but as something you give away or donate. Stop conceiving dopamine as a feel-good hormone, but think about it as a currency of productive activity, which you give away every time you consume something that you don't need. Dopamine reserves are finite, and smart allocation of your resources is key to having your mental health in check. Now, a person who continuously and chronically wears down his prefrontal cortex is unable to control and inhibit the anxiety-driving HPA axis. You see, the internet, unlike the book, is decentralized. Different memes as informational units are competing for your brain, more specifically for your currency of work, i.e. dopamine. And the more decision-making you are engaged with, the more your prefrontal cortex is exhausted. Studies have demonstrated that taking a week off from social media improves one's well-being and mental health, which is a direct result of regaining self-control and the ability to inhibit fear and anxiety. I have dug up studies demonstrating how social media and internet consumption lead to social anxiety and chronic stress. One study shows how chronic social media users exhibit an increase of neurotransmitter GABA in the anterior cingulate cortex. GABA is a primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system, which prevents its target neurons from firing. Now, the anterior cingulate cortex is the seat of social cognition, self-control, and motivation. People with akinetic mutism, who are chronically demotivated, just lay down without any sign of wanting to engage in any form of activities, exhibit chronically depressed anterior cingulate cortexes. Constant worry about one's self-perception in social media, competing and comparing oneself to other people and their supposed perfect lives, and surfing and scrolling short, stimulating yet empty videos, depletes the very reserves of motivation that need to be allocated to self-fulfilling activities. The amygdala, as a part of the limbic system responsible for mediating fear, anxiety, and emotions, tells the hypothalamus, a government of your endocrine system, to launch a stress response. Constant fight or flight or sympathetic drive is one of the leading cause of anxiety and panic attacks. Hear what Robert Sapolsky writes in his book, Behave. Mobilizing energy while sprinting for your life helps save you. Do the same thing chronically because of a stressful 30-year mortgage and you are at risk for various metabolic problems, including adult-onset diabetes. Likewise with blood pressure. Increase it to sprint across the savanna, good thing. Increase it because of chronic psychological stress and you've got stress-induced hypertension. Chronically impair growth and tissue repair and you'll pay the price. Increased depressive and suicidal symptoms among adolescents have been linked to increased consumption of smartphones. Interestingly, a study done in 2020 explores the neural correlates of smartphone dependence and its connection with depression and anxiety. The study demonstrated the correlation between self-reported smartphone dependence and node centrality of the right amygdala, alongside sleep deprivation, which is another way anxiety and depression can become serious issues. Additionally, social network site addiction is associated with a more efficient impulsive brain system, manifested through reduced gray matter volumes in the amygdala. This makes social network addiction similar to other types of addiction, such as gambling, as both of them exhibit similar neurological bases. Now, the relationship between consuming shorts and TikTok with fight or flight is indirect. Consumption wears down the prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate cortex, which sends inhibitory connections to the amygdala, telling it to calm down, thus preventing the sympathetic drive of fight-or-flight response. Hundreds of incremental decision-makings while scrolling the internet, worrying about other people's perceptions, engaging with unnecessary toxicity, and all associated unhealthy habits fries the prefrontal cortex and ACC. Thus, we arrive at Peter Sloterdijk's concept of disinhibiting media. You see, media doesn't provoke stress and anxiety directly, but rather through the process of disinhibition.
This inhibition is an act of turning off the lever, the Athenian forehead of rationality and self-control. It is not an accident that two primary sites that are affected during the consumption of social media are prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate cortex, newly evolved areas responsible for self-control, social cognition, motivation, focus, and inhibition of impulsive behavior. After the very inhibitory centers are inhibited by virtue of this inhibition, the anxiety-inducing HPA axis takes over your life. After your prefrontal cortex and ACC are distracted and worn out, your impulsive system becomes fertile and ready to receive messages like just do it and all related advertisements that try to evade your Apollinian filter, which sorts out relevant information from the irrelevant one. Now that we live in the age of information overload, your exhausted prefrontal cortex is too distracted from its primary purpose of regulating fear, anxiety and stress. Well, I think we live in overstimulated times. We crave stimulation for its own sake, gorge ourselves on it. We always want more, whether it's tactile, emotional or sexual, and I think that's bad. Consider how shopping and strolling in the shopping mall is exhausting, the reason being that constant decision-making wears out the prefrontal cortex. The same thing takes place with internet surfing. Multitasking is another property of electronic media. Typical internet consumer engages in multitasking on a daily basis. Even if one is not forced to multitask in the workplace, people still do their job alongside with scrolling social media and distracting themselves with short videos. The problem with multitasking or doing different things at the same time has to do with the good cop, bad cop effect. A suspect being interrogated by two different personalities experiences an exhaustion of his decision making, rational executive center and prefrontal cortex. This makes him more susceptible to making mistakes as he has to constantly switch his strategy of speaking and thinking when communicating with two different types of people at the same time. Now, here's a quick breakdown and summary of our current situation with smartphones and social media and how it induces mass anxiety and chronic stress. Studies show that continual use of social media causes anhedonia, which denotes an inability to experience pleasure. This, in turn, contributes to internet-related addictive behavior. It exhausts and wears out the prefrontal cortex and ACC, responsible for social cognition and impulse control. One study demonstrates widespread deficits in white matter integrity of the orbitofrontal area and ACC. Multitasking, which contributes to central nervous system overload, further exacerbates the aforementioned problems. And finally, it causes sleep deprivation and chronic stress, contributing to the problems listed above. To sum up, newly emerged internet addiction disorder has a similar neurological basis as a heavy substance abuse, which makes it even more alarming. Now here's how dopamine stimulating and reward seeking behavior lays the foundation for anxiety and depression. In order for you to produce dopamine, you need the amino acid tyrosine, whereas the neurotransmitter responsible for the sense of contentment and the mood regulation, serotonin, requires the amino acid tryptophan. You see, those amino acids are in competition with each other when trying to pass the blood-brain barrier so that they can turn into their respective neurotransmitters. When people constantly wear out their dopamine system, transporters that tryptophan would need to get into your brain are absent getting dopamine precursor tyrosine into your brain. There is a reason why anxiety and depression treating drugs are SSRIs, meaning drugs that act on serotonin reuptake proteins. Heavy reward-seeking behavior limits serotonin production and hence prevents you from being content. Thus we get the formula where reward trumps contentment, as those two are not one and the same, which in turn creates the effect of mass anxiety by hijacking the very system that would prevent you from experiencing chronic stress and getting into a depression. Another problem is that electronic media began to offer the very solutions to the problems that it caused in the first place. Hence, you become a servo mechanism to the electronic media, creating a feedback loop and vicious circle that one cannot escape. As McLuhan points out, by continuously embracing technologies, we relate ourselves to them as servo mechanisms. That is why we must, to use them at all, serve these objects, these extensions of ourselves, as gods or minor religions. An Indian is the servo mechanism of his canoe, as the cowboy of his horse, or the executive of his clock. 
physiologically, man in the normal use of technology, or his variously extended body, is perpetually modified by it, and in turn finds ever new ways of modifying his technology. Man becomes, as it were, the sex organs of the machine world, as the bee of the plant world, enabling it to fecundate and to evolve ever new forms. McLuhan here is talking about mechanical technology, which is an extension of our musculature. Electronic technology, on the other hand, directly affects our nervous system, creating a literal effect of merging with technology by exploiting the plasticity of the brain. Therefore, internet addiction disorder becomes the modern meta disorder, as it lays the foundation for many other types of mental issues that emerge through internet addiction. Another problem of the consumer society of hyperstimulation is the inability to differentiate comfort and rest from pleasure and hedonism. Nowadays, resting or taking a break from everyday irritants, ranging from workplace to social media toxicity, means submerging yourself into the pool of counter irritants. These are the counter irritants that the electronic media offers you as an antidote to the problem that it created in the first place. Hence, the pandemic of satisfying videos that are designed to function as a counter irritant. As McLuhan points out, whereas pleasure is a counter irritant, for example, sports, entertainment, and alcohol, comfort is the removal of irritants. The counter irritants, on the other hand, such as satisfying videos or unending TikTok shorts, act as a device known as Audiac. The patient lying on the dental chair puts on headphones and turns a dial, rising the noise level to the point that he feels no pain from the drill. The selection of a single sense for intense stimulus, or a single extended isolated or amputated sense and technology, is in part the reason for the numbing effect that technology as such has on its makers and users. In the modern world, the counter-irritants offered by short videos and pornography numb our prefrontal cortexes with the false promise that it is not exhausting. Here we arrive at the most famous phrase by Marshall McLuhan, the medium is the message. The content that you consume is irrelevant to the general effect and influence that a specific technology has on you. In the long run, what matters is how you are changed by engaging with a specific technology rather than what type of content you are consuming at a given moment. Now, our blindness of narcissists with regards to the effects of technology on our brains creates the very illusion of being unable to locate the source of anxiety. The pandemic of panic attacks with sudden fight-or-flight responses and heart palpitations can no longer be rationalized in the age of worn-out foreheads and chronically stressed-out nervous wrecks. Now I want to send special thanks to Patreons who helped the channel grow. The channel is in its embryonic phase and your support is therefore priceless. I decided to make author-oriented content that I will only upload on my Patreon page. You can find the link in the description. Thank you and stay tuned. Plus Oblivion is not the name I was born with. That's my television name. Soon all of us will have special names.